Hello everybody. So this is our video on the basics and the intro on Señor La Muerte, otherwise known as San La Muerte, otherwise known as Señor de la Buena Muerte, and various other titles. So let's just jump straight into some of his history so that we have an understanding as to how long his veneration has been active. Well, one of the very first backstories was that of a god. He was seen as having a history of a god. That god was known by the name of Tupa Cuera, and this was a rain god, a lightning god, a thunder god. The Guarani would pay homage to this rain god because they were afraid of flooding, they were afraid of droughts. Let's talk about the Franciscan monk. This is probably one of the biggest backstories that you're going to hear by people who worship San La Muerte and who pay him and who pay him veneration in around the 16th century. When he arrived, he took care of the lepers and he grew, grew actually quite fond of these people and they grew fond of him because guess what for some reason this monk had major healing powers he really knew how to work those herbs he took advantage of the environment he learned the environment and he learned the land and he utilized those herbs and the knowledge that he had to heal many 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 people um, this is located on the banks of the Uruguay River. So all is going well until King Carlos III of Spain wanted the removal of the Jesuits. But when this Franciscan monk was called back to Spain, they put him in a prison in a cell with the rest of the lepers. So with that, he didn't protest. He decided to go into the cell with the lepers. But in protests, he decides to fast. And he has with him this cane, this type of cane, the kind that is wood and that has a handle at the top shaped kind of like an L. So in his fasting moments, he's leaning up against this cane. Well, he dies. And when they finally go to check on him, He's completely skin over bone, and he's leaning up against this cane, this L-shaped stick. And some stories that I have seen have said that when they found him, even though he was dead, he raised his finger to point at his accusers. And in that standing position, he fell. So because of all of his good deeds with the Guarani people, they essentially, after being evangelized, that is, they essentially turned him into what was known as a santo because he did so many good deeds. Now, of course, there are variations to the story just depending on who you talk to, but that's the, the whole of the story that I have found as to why he was associated with a Franciscan monk. When he died, he was wearing the monk's garb. But he was a very holy, very spiritual, and a very um, humanitarian-based person. So with all of that in mind, and helping the lepers and the Guarani, he was placed in a level of superiority, a saint. So there's another story. This story is about a king, a living king, who was once so just, so understanding of his people, very well respected. When he died, he went to heaven. And when he did, God told him to look at his, look around, look at his environment. There's all these candles all over the place, different sizes, different shapes. And he says, God says to him, the king, he says, you see how all these candles are lit? When one of them goes out, I'm entrusting you to go and find that soul, collect it, and bring it back to me. And 
the story pretty much ends there in a nutshell. He was trusted by God to bring the souls of man back to God. And so this is why he's trusted by his devotees, because they know that he's going to bring their soul back to God. Okay, now this next one is really cool. This one is another native story, but it involves a native man. So in essence, this man was going through a rite of passage. He was a young Guarani man. He was to be sent off to complete his mission as essentially what you could call a shaman. He was entrusted by the village elder to become the new shaman. Well, he was supposed to go into the jungle and stay there without food, without water for seven days. If he was able to complete this in seven days, he could come back and claim his title. Well, see, he wasn't supposed to tell anybody about this, but he ended up telling his girlfriend. He told his girlfriend because, you know what, hey, maybe he was a logical guy. <laughs> so he was gone for too long. The girlfriend started to get worried. So she went to go look for him. She did find him. Sadly, she found him dead, covered in ants. And let me tell you, for future courses, ants are very prevalent. So she found him covered in ants and she was just distraught, completely and totally distraught. So in her distress, after mourning him, she grabs his finger, removes it from his body and takes it home with her. She takes the finger home with her and she finds that her mother or mother-in-law, I forget which one, but she finds that her mother or mother-in-law is very sick. And in her own distress, she calls upon her dead boyfriend and says, please help to heal my mother. Please help to heal, heal her with all of your ability. Boom, she's healed. Okay, so moving on to another one. This one's going to be pretty quick. All right, so when the monks arrived to where the Guarani people were located at the time, they brought with them an image of Christ. That image of Christ was the Christ of patience, okay? That Christ was sitting down with his elbows on his knees and with his hands up to his chin. Okay? So to the Warani people, this looked very, very, very similar to an image that they used to carve out of wood of, a, of an emaciated dead person curled up in the fetal position. And the reason that they would carve it like that is because that fetal position was representative of the cycles of life. And that's how they bury their dead in a fetal position. So this hands on the chin depiction of Christ was very, very similar to their depiction. And, you know, back in the day, correlation was enough to make a connection. Something looking the same was enough to make that transition, you know. So these two images started to become very similar, and eventually they became correlated as one. So with that being said, the day of veneration starts on August 15th, just the same as the Lord of Humility and Patience. You'll notice that his San La Muerte's celebration days go from August 15th to August 20th. And another story I've heard about that is that one of the reasons that they can celebrate anywhere between those days, sometimes even earlier or sometimes even later, is because that's the amount of time that the Jesuit monk was fasting and trapped in the cell when he died. So, as you've noticed, just like with most 
origin stories of folk saints, you'll notice the syncretizations. They were forced in a lot of circumstances, or they were selected by the people as a better understanding and as acclamation to new times and to new religious beliefs. So he's been syncretized with Christ. He's been syncretized with a king. He's been syncretized with a god. And he's been syncretized to a native man who was a, a shaman in the works. <laughs> so um, I've also heard him syncretized to other spirits, but we'll discuss that later. So the people of Argentina, the people of Corrientes, the people of Uruguay tend to stick to these origin stories because they're very much a part of the heart of their homeland. And he's very much a part of their homeland. And this is how they choose to see him. And this is how they choose to accept him. So with that being said, his personality, if you will, for a spirit, is very loving, understanding. But he's also built as a warrior. He's also built to seek justice. He is known by some as a severe but just saint. So he is very willing as a spirit to rain justice upon your opponent or upon one who would choose to do you or your family harm. To, I must say though, in the United States to acquire an image of him is very hard. You have to know somebody in Argentina or you have to know somebody in that area to get a specific statue of San La Muerte for you. Because the thing is, is that yes, people do tend to substitute images of La Santa Muerte with San La Muerte, but it wouldn't be historically accurate. Uh, San La Muerte oftentimes is not seen as holding a globe. He doesn't have the scales of justice depicted on his images. He doesn't have the owl depicted in his images. What he oftentimes has is a robe and a scythe and oftentimes a crown because of his king backstory. More times than most, you'll either see him standing with his scythe and sometimes red eyes with a bloody scythe or you'll see him seated on a throne. Either way, these are both good depictions of Señor La Muerte. He is a holy and good and victorious spirit. This is how the majority of his followers and devotees will see him. Now, with that being said, we also do have the side of people that utilize his abilities in a more malefic manner or in a more crafty based manner and those are the people that take advantage of his reaping abilities we'll just say that now just like with any other saint if you use them for evil or if you use them for bad you're gonna get flack from the die-hard devotees that see him as a holy being. The same can be said about Santa Muerte. You have the two different types of followers, the ones that light candles with petition and veneration, and the ones that do witchcraft and that do spell work with her. And then some people do both. You'll find that with Señor La Muerte. They, some people refuse and restrict any kind of dark magic or any kind of malefic purposes when it comes to their santo. And then, of course, you have the other side of people who are saying, yes, but that santo can also wreak havoc on my enemies. And there are very dark works that you can do with San La Muerte, which, yes, I have access to. <laughs> um, but for the most part, if you wanted to just start a veneration with him, all you'd really have to do is acquire an image of him 
if at all possible. If not, you can just print out an image of him, which is perfectly fine, and say some of his prayers. You can give him specific offerings, which I'll go over next. And you can pray to him and you can ask him for protection either on certain days or every day. It's entirely up to you. So, cause we're trying to do here is separate the veneration from the practice. <laughs> so from here, if you want a basic setup for him, what you can do is set aside a small table for him or a small area for him, preferably off the ground because even though many would say to keep him on the ground, what you are, what, if you're wanting to do is veneration or start your relationship, get him off the ground on a table with a white cloth. And what you're going to do is you're going to get him a little vase, a little cup or a clear cup, a crystal cup, cup of car red carnations, seven of them. Seven is a big number for him seven red carnations into a little cup or vase. You're going to give him some water and then also give him a shot glass of whiskey. You're also going to get his candles. Now, this is something that I've noticed a lot of people debate with, but traditionally what you're going to get is a black and white candle, meaning that the candle has to be white on top and black on bottom. Please try to find that first before you decide on a secondary option. Now, if you can't get your hands on a white on top, black on bottom candle, you can use a regular white candle, preferably a stick candle, because in Argentina, and in his, in his area of origin, seven-day glass candles are not too prevalent. They use them, but they're not too prevalent. So your setup, once again, white tablecloth, seven red carnations in a vase or a cup, a little cup of water, and a little shot glass of whiskey, his image, and the, the more popular prayer which I'm going to post in the description. It'll be in Spanish, but I'll also post it in English as well. So that is a good way to get started with Señor La Muerte. And you can pray his prayers on Tuesdays and on Fridays. So that's a basic setup. I would advise that you do that first before anything. And remember, he is a lord of the dead, meaning that he has reign and that he touches the souls of the dead. So, just depending, you may or may not experience activity in your home. And that's normal when you welcome any kind of spirit into your home, but it's especially normal when you welcome a Lord of the dead, holy or not, into your home. So keep that in mind. Don't worry. He's there to protect. So even if you do experience things, that's usually his way of announcing his presence. Remember, he's kind of like a tornado of the dead. He's always going to be surrounded by the dead. So that's something to keep in mind. Well, with that being said, his numbers are seven, and oftentimes in his sigil, which he does have a sigil, his sigil has number 13. So I'll list the prayer in the description, and what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to create a series of courses that got really in-depth with working with him, get really in-depth with his symbology, get in depth with his prayers, his petitions, uh, with doing malefic work. Yes. And it's some pretty hardcore stuff. 
I gotta warn you, if you're squeamish, it might not be for you. But this I would like to post for the public. And now that we've reached the end of the video, I'd like to thank two important Brandons <laughs> that introduced me to Señor La Muerte and that guided me in my initial steps. Because without them, I wouldn't have been able to take it as far as I was able to take it to. Which now, months, months later, I am the happiest I've ever been. But those are the people that have primarily influenced me and this path with Señor La Muerte, and I couldn't be happier. So I just want to give credit where it's due. So with that being said, I'm going to do my best on this path and on this course with Señor La Muerte and to help the public to understand, especially the public that only speaks English. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. If my information that I provided here is different from what you've heard, keep in mind that a lot of times this is an oral tradition. So what I've heard and what I've experienced might be different from what you heard and you experienced. So let's keep that in mind. Let's try to be mindful, not be rude in the comments because I have to approve the comments. So with that being said, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And thank you for watching.